Well, I am so excited. When Jay asked me to teach, um, he asked David and I um, in a, a meeting, and I said, yeah, like, you know, I, I can talk. And then he said, I'd like to, for you to talk about prayer in the throne room. And I, was, I laughed at him. I'm going to be real. I laughed and thought there are so many more qualified people to talk about this topic, period. Like, are you sure you want me to end this series? And he said, yes. And then I double checked again and he still said yes. So, so here we are and we're going to be talking about the throne room and our prayers. Um, before we get started, I have a picture of us uh, or a picture of me. If you did not know, okay, so this is me. We'll just leave that picture there. Um, I broke my tailbone in the beginning of February. I went snowboarding with Sam and a friend and this is me so excited. You can't see because it's some, um, I have my thumbs up. I got on the conveyor belt all by myself. Sam and her friend were already like on the belt. They'd went and I had it on a bucket list. I a 40-year bucket list, and going snowboarding was one of my things. Now, Samantha, my daughter, very kindly, not disrespectfully at all, reminded me that the last time I had been snowboarding was literally a lifetime ago. And she was right. The last time I went snowboarding, I was like 18, 19 years old, and that is, in fact, between that time and now, someone's life. There's someone around here who's 20, 21, and that was the time how long ago I went. I did my due diligence, you guys. I watched a few YouTube videos to make sure I knew what I was doing. Um, I, when I went snowboarding, I went with someone who was very experienced. Um, and what I recall in my young but older mind these days was it was a lot of fun. I laughed and I was on the floor, but we had a great time. So I went snowboarding with Sam on the spur of the moment. I had thought like, you should do lessons. I'm like, no, I got this. I watch these videos like I can do that. And lo and behold, after my first almost run halfway down, um, my balance is not what it used to be. My core strength is definitely not what it used to be. And it was a lot icier than I remembered, and I fell. I, uh, I didn't actually fall. Sam and her friend understandably laughed at me because I actually rolled. And as I rolled, I rolled both feet forward, landed on my tailbone first, and then back, and then hit my head, and my head bounced for a second time for good measure. And I laid there and thought, oh gosh, I don't feel very good. And so I didn't know what was wrong at that point. I just felt like I was going to throw up. I knew it, was a concu it wasn't a concussion. And so I continued down, <sighs> attempted to go down, and went down a little bit further. And um, about second time of falling yet again, because again, my core strength is not what it was. I am not 19 years old. And my YouTube videos let me down. Um, I was sitting there squatting, and I thought, gosh, this feels painful. Finally made my way down the hill, told Sam and her friend, hey, you guys just keep going. I'm going to go sit down. And when I sat down, I immediately realized I didn't know what it was, that something was wrong. I went, got a snack. It hurt to laugh. And um, I told them, I'm going to go sit in the car. You guys just do whatever you need to do. Because, you know, you guys, skiing and snowboarding is not, like, cheap. So I wasn't going to be, like, to Sam's friend, like, hey, I know you just paid all this money, but we got to go. Like, I was fine. You know, I am, I am someone, I don't know if anyone is like that here, I just power through. I can just like, I can just do it. Like I can just bear down. I can take the pain. I can just push through this. And so my next picture is me walking upstairs um, for proof that I was in pain. Um, I was in a lot of pain. I, I think I'm funny. I, I, my life is an open book. Um, like the Lord put me in where he put me. So I like to, you know, capture some of these things. So this is me. I was literally, I had walked up the stairs and I was like, what is happening? Um, and so what I found out of, few days later, I mean, like I was supposed to teach that Sunday. I could barely get up the stairs. I'm like rolling in bed was that I had broke my tailbone. And if you know anything about a broken tailbone, um, the only way that it heals is to rest. There is nothing you can do. There, um, you got to lay down. So for the first two weeks, I was in my room laying down. When I would roll out of bed, I would like full body roll. If you guys know what I'm talking, has anyone ever done that? Where you're, it's like full body roll, okay, and up. And then to get back in bed, I'd like full body roll and go. I'm just letting you into my life, you guys. This is just real life, okay? And so I just continued to push through because the last thing I wanted to do was be a burden. I have a family who is busy um, and they like to do this thing called eat. Um, and so I, there was things I just needed help with. And so, um, and of course I would not ask for help. I just did it. 
Um, it would have been helpful, and I'm sure we ate out probably more than normal. Um, but I never asked for help, and the longer I laid in bed, the more I felt like a burden. The more the list of things that I could be doing, um, the more my mind wandered, and, and the thing that kept coming back around was, you're just a burden. Well, it was on my bucket list, so, you know, I'm, I'm sitting with this burden. It's, it's, it's there. And what I realize is how many times is that our approach towards the Lord? We're just going to get down and we're going to bear it. We're just going to like, I know what to do. He's given me the mind of Christ and I'm just going to grin and bear it. I'm just going to keep showing up, keep. And, and really the Lord is just saying, won't you just call out to me? You don't need to bear any burden. We don't need to solve anything. You know, the reality is, I don't know if it's about, if anyone could agree with this, but I know that there's prayers that I have prayed that I feel like have never been answered. There's prayers that I prayed years. I mean, within the last, like, seven years. When I say years, I mean, like, recently, where I've prayed and cried out, and things just don't seem to, they just seem to get worse. Uh, there doesn't seem to be breakthrough. Um, the, it just doesn't seem to resolve itself. And so more and more often, instead of praying, we just try to solve it ourselves. I believe that in learning and processing, and the Lord reminded me as I was sleeping about, I mean, obviously my broken tailbone. I've been wearing jeans, thank God. Like, I am glad I can wear jeans now. Um, but I hadn't worn jeans in a while. And so I was laying in bed, and the Lord began to kind of break down my little experience with snowboarding. So trivial, but, you know, just walking me through these things. I'm not going to rush. I felt pressure to rush. And I just said, Lord, I'm not going to rush through this, but I am going to encourage you to take notes. Um, because the reason we take notes isn't just to like take notes. Um, the reason we take notes is because it's when the Lord is speaking to you, because my heart is that, um, that you hear the Lord through scripture, that maybe something I say reminds you of something he's already said. Um, and then the other thing is, so you can go back and read your word and you can go back and look at these scriptures. That's why we take notes. Um, they're reminders for me. Like I go back in my journals and I see what I've cried out to God. I see what I've wrote out. I see the things he's spoken to me word. So I would encourage you to, um, to take some notes today. I'm going to pray and then we're going to continue on. Father God, we just thank you for what you're doing, Lord. And, um, as we are in the midst of Palm Sunday, Lord, where everyone was celebrating and calling out to you, Lord, most of our life is like the Monday through Friday. We can feel the pressure of life. We can feel the places being forgotten. We have people who turn on us. We have people who are accusational, Lord. You know we are all facing different things of what you face from Palm Sunday to your, to your or um, dying on the cross for us. And so God, I just pray that as we get in your word today, that there would just be a revelation through your word that would impact us, which Lord, you were, you had a revelation of what you were intended to do that sustained you to push through when you felt like you couldn't push through. God, I pray that you would speak to us. We pray and we open our ears and Lord, we uh, just thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for what you're doing in this place and we thank you for what you're doing in us. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. You know, nothing, I'm going to say, there's a few things that bless me, but nothing blesses me more than when my kids' friends come over, walk in without knocking. Most of most people on our staff and or our kids' friends know how to get into our home. They know the code to our garage. Um, it's just the risk that we run in our home. But nothing blesses me more than when they come in, they're like, hey, they call me Suze. Hey, Suze. Hey, J-Pop. That's what they call Jay. Hey, J-Pop. They come in. They go to the refrigerator. They open the refrigerator. They pull out a cutie. Uh, maybe they'll run downstairs. They'll go grab a bag of chips, go get something to drink. Hey, what are we having for dinner? Nothing blesses me more than when Micah, Sam and Isaac and their friends come over and they make themselves at home. Like I am not offended by it by any means. This is just my personal for me in our home. Nothing blesses me more than when Micah calls me and says, and this happens often, hey, I have two friends who are coming over for dinner. Got it. I have, I have already started to position myself to just make more food. Either we're going to have leftovers or there's going to be people who join us. Nothing blesses me more than when someone calls and say, hey, are you home? Can I stop by? That just brings me so much joy, you guys. I, I grew up with an aunt that lived down the street, and I just knew I would 
walk home from school, I would go to her house, Hey, how's it going? Go in, say hi, and then walk on the way, rest of the way home. To this day, when I go to visit my, I don't even, I don't know that I have my aunts and my uncle's names who are my mom's brother and sister still alive. When I go, when I go home, I just go visit them. You just kind of run the risk. Either they're going to be there or they're not going to be there. I'd go, that's just how I was brought up. You just go. You just knock. You call my friend's parents. I call them mom and dad. Just what it is. Nothing blesses me more though when everyone comes into the house and they know that they belong. They come into the home and they know they have access to all the things that are available with them without hesitation. You know, this is what the throne room of heaven is like for us and it's intended to be. It's intended to be a place where we boldly walk in. Now I'm gonna tell you, these kids are not, um, they'll, they'll come, if we're in our room, they'll come in and talk to us, but they're not being irreverent towards our house. They're not being, you know, they're not going places they shouldn't be but they know exactly what they have access to. I'm going to tell you in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, and this has been one of the scriptures we've been talking about. It says, let us, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help for help or to help in time of need. This is what we've been talking about. And I can tell you if there's one thing I'm learning more about my relationship with the fathers really as my relationship with my kids grows. As those, as those relationships expand, I begin to see the father's heart even more for us. So today we're going to be talking about the throne room of grace and prayer. Because in scripture it says that we would come boldly into his throne room. I'm telling you, these kids come boldly into my house. They don't come quietly. They don't come like, no, doesn't matter what time of day it is. I'm telling you at two o'clock sometimes, I'm like, you guys, like church is tomorrow. There was one day literally, I was like, church is tomorrow. I, I need you to be quiet. You know, and you hear them, they're like making food at two o'clock and everything's like doors shut. And I hear everything. So, right, these kids come boldly because they know they have free access. They come boldly because they know that they're accepted. They come boldly because they know there's going to be food at the table and I am going to want to eat some. They come boldly. You know, I talk, as I was saying, so many times we can take the position of feeling like I don't want to burden someone. I don't want to burden God. I can figure this out. And the Lord is saying, no, my heart for you is for you to come boldly into my throne, to come boldly and ask, because for you, I have things. I have mercy set for you. I have a grace for your time of need. So won't you come boldly into my presence and know that this is where you belong and you have access to everything. When Jesus died on the cross, literally the veil was torn so that we could have access. So we no longer had like occasional access through a priest. It's so that we could have godly access anytime we need because now we have Jesus who's sitting on the right hand, who's interceding for us and says, no, they're yours. That's your daughter. That's your son. And he knows us by name. See, we are in a time where either we're going to walk boldly into the things that he's already put before us, or we're going to shrink back in self-preservation because it's a little scary. I can remember one of, the, I've seen it on the face, the difference between when we have friends who know how the house functions and friends who don't, they kind of look like, are you supposed to be doing, like, you know, like, I'll be like, hey, I, I waited, someone come over and Mike was doing something, so I told his friend, can you get so-and-so a cup of water? Like, it's, he's not even my kid, but it's like, you've been here before, you know the role, can you just do it for me? Because I, because I'm doing something, right? And these other kids are like, what? No, that's the kind of access we have, that we can come on, on behalf of others and contend in prayer because of the access of mercy that is found at the throne of grace. This life isn't just to be lived to accomplish things. I think we got to continue to remember that, that we're not just living here for titles. We're not just living here for positions. I had a friend um, who I talked to frequently and, and, and they were just bringing some correction and saying, Susie, the Lord has you. You need to know what are you intended for? You're more than this, right? We're not just here for this like setup of a good life. We're here to contend and see the presence of God happening and people experiencing it here on earth. Number one, our prayers are not a burden to our heavenly father. 
You are not a burden to your heavenly father. You know, so many times um, our own experiences from life will begin to creep in about how we perceive who God is. Just it. It's the way that he has it set up. But I'm here to tell you that you are not a burden to the Lord. Your prayers are not a burden. In fact, Psalms 100, uh, 141 verses 1 and 2, if you have your Bibles, it says, Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out. Let my prayers be set before you as incense. The lifting of my hands in the evening sacrifice. Let me tell you, did we not just sing that song? Let incense arise day and night, night and day. Let incense arise. Our prayers are incense to the Lord. They are not a burden. They're intended as a sweet aroma. Just think about that. When we call out to God, it's a, te- it's a sweet incense. It's an aroma before him. Revelation um, says this in two places. So David is saying, Lord, when I cry out, would my prayers just be an incense to you? And then we read in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 says this. It's this beautiful. John is, is describing this beautiful vision. In verse 8, it says, now when he had taken the scroll, the four, four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Oh, I just, I'm telling you, I just, as I, as I've been meditating on this, as I've been thinking about this, my prayers to the Lord are an incense to him. To to some people, I might be frustrating, annoying, or whatever, but when I call out to my father, when I'm praying, he's saying, ah, Susie, your words are an incense. And not only are they an incense as all of heaven is worshiping. You, we, we read in the, um, in the Old Testament where they would, we had the, the Ark of the Tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant and it was set up and there was a place of incense that would come that would be lit. And now we're reading in Revelation that the, sa- the same place of incense that there's this golden bowl filled with the prayers of the saints. Filled with the prayers of the saints. That it says that they pour out. And and then we go to Revelation chapter 6. And yet again, it says, verse 1. Now I saw the lamb open one of his seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And now I looked and behold, a white horse. And he sat on a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and conquered. Wait, I want to make sure. Oh, no, wrong verse. That's that's chapter 6 of Revelation. (laughs) Chapter 8. Eight of Revelation, verse one through six. There we go. I was like, that doesn't seem familiar. All right, here we are. Wait. I keep going to chapter six. Maybe I need to go back and read chapter six later. Okay, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. I thought that was really cool. Can we just talk about that for a minute? Like, we don't really ever see time, like we see time as an interesting concept in scripture. But here it says, John is saying, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. I love reading scripture and seeing those little nuances. I don't know. It just makes me smile. Like, just an, like that didn't have to be put in there. Okay, anyways, we'll just keep going. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and they, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel having a gold censer came and stood at the altar and he was given much incense. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Here's a beautiful picture in what's in the midst of the presence of God. The prayers of the saints. Being used and it into, do we get what is happening here? Do you realize that our prayers are not a burden? And even in places where um, things feel wasted and like they've not been heard, not one of our prayers will be wasted. You know, I heard a testimony of someone who was saying that they prayed for a, um, for a, a friend's husband who um, had a, a drinking problem. For 27 years, they prayed. 
27 years. It wasn't until he, and this was a testimony I was hearing, and this person was talking about prayer. And she went on to say, and she asked the Lord on his deathbed, he's dying now. He comes and he gets reconciled with the Lord. And she said, Lord, why? Why did we wait 27 years? And she said she heard the Lord say, not one of your prayers were wasted. You were praying for every other person. You were interceding for people you had no clue about. Not one of our prayers will be wasted. They are in heavenly places being poured out as incense. Do we get what is happening? That this is so much bigger than the comfort of our life and our families. It's about other people. That Jesus came and what we're celebrating in the midst of celebrating had nothing to do with him and everything to do with everyone else. I know we want revival. I know we want these moves of God. For what? For what? Our response should be so people can know him, come to, you know, have salvation. That should be our response, right? We're praying and contending. You don't even know what you might be standing in between. You may not know your prayers, what they might be preventing from happening. You don't even know how many times your prayers have stood up as a shield for someone who had someone not praying for them. And the problem is we have gotten so worried about the wrong things the wrong things. And the Lord is saying, would you not know that your prayers are an incense before me? I hear every one of them. Not only does he hear every one of them, you're not forsaken. There is, there is life that will continue to happen. And his heart is for us to call out to him, not try to solve it. I'm going to tell you, there is no, no matter where you stand on any of this, first of all, if you've not read the Bible, the Lord already knows what's happening. I just was reading Revelation chapter 21, and it said, like, it's it's already finished. He already said who's not entering heaven. He already has some... He has a standard. He called out that people would become cold towards one each other, cold towards love. He talked about how in the latter days, like that there will be young people who will rise up in rebellion and there'll be mother against father, father against son. Like he's already, everything that we are walking through and has already been said. It may, may, and may not be exactly, but it's already been said in here. And what we need to realize is we can either keep saying it to him or we can change our posture towards prayer towards him. We can either keep saying it to him or we can change our posture of prayer towards him. All right, I'm going to tell you, I am really amped up about this. And maybe it's because um, I see, not like in theory here, not in retweet, not in opinion, I see what our generate what the generation of my kids and, and after them are, are walking through. I see it. They don't, they don't need me to spiritualize something. They, they need me contending with them and for them. We have a generation of kids who are being bombarded every day with information. They, they know in the depths of their, their heart, most of them know what is right and what's wrong. I'm just speaking from my experience. I, I know the kids, some te- teens sometimes get a bad rap for saying, mom, I know, I know. No, but they know. Like there's things that they do know. And if anything, they know more than anyone what it's like to have to try to rise up in a dark place. They are walking through it every day. You know, Jay and I, we were talking about some things and he looked at me and said, honey, we get to do things differently. We get to do things differently. We get to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord differently than any generation before us. I'm telling you guys, I know there's a lot that we want, but to see the kingdom of God at hand is going to cost us something. And the first place it costs us is in our prayer room and storming boldly the throne room of grace and coming on the children's behalf, on the kids' behalf of people who have walked away from the Lord and say, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They need us interceding. They don't need me looking good. They don't need me acting like all of whatever 
heart. No, they need me to hear from God on their behalf to declare truth over them, to declare protection over them, to declare that God would reign in their life until they are able to get their feet set up and walk on their own. This is serious business. Most of us in this room, most of us in this room are over 55. Most of us in this room have our salvation taken care of. Most of us in our room have already walked in obedience to God in some capacity and are living in maybe even the fruit of your obedience. We didn't just get here to get here. It's not to go into cruise control. It's to begin to pick up our sword and go on behalf. Because I can tell you, um, my strength is, well, now that's a questionable thing. There was a time where my strength was different than my kid's strength. But I'll tell you where I can sway and sword and go after anything. And that's in the throne room of God more than they can ever do. He has given me promises He has given my family promises. He has spoken to my mom. He's given her promises. And those aren't, God's will isn't just going to happen, guys. Let me just tell you, it's not, it's not like, oh, well, if God, no. Jesus had to make a conscious decision. And we're going to talk about that from here until his crucifixion. He had to make a decision despite it being God's will for him to be crucified. Just think about that. He had to make a decision to be crucified. Our lives are not set up so we can go into cruise control. When we look at scripture, you look at Moses and Abraham and Jacob and what were they doing in their last days? They were laying hands. They were proclaiming blessing. They were talking from generation to generation. You don't get off easy because you've done all the right things. We're the ones who should be contending and drawing them in and bringing them in. It says that they knew from generation to generation. How? By the way people proclaimed what God had done. So we're talking about prayer. Psalms 56 verse 8 says this, you number my wanderings, you put my tears in a bottle. Are they not in your book? I'm here to tell you that whatever you've experienced, your your tears, your cry, your prayers, your places of feeling forgotten, you have not been forgotten. The Lord has your tears wrapped up. He has our prayers as an incense in a golden bowl, which I don't even know how that works, but he put it in there to be poured out. It has not been forsaken. You have not been forsaken. And God is saying, will you not keep calling out to me? Will you not keep coming boldly into my throne room until you see the will of God come to pass in my lo- in your life? Will you not be like the woman who came to the judge and kept coming and coming and coming until she got what she needed? See, we've given up too easy because It's comfortable. I can live my life pretty comfortably and say some good prayers and do church good on Sunday and everything could be untouched. Cost me nothing. You guys, I don't know what your heart is to see the will of God come to pass. I don't know the things he has spoken to you to come to pass, but my heart is that we would be ignited, that we would be ignited, that we would be ignited, that we would take these not because we want a big church. I am not interested in a big church for big church sake. I am interested in people experiencing the move of God in this place. And we as a church have the capacity to lead and be people who come alongside side, if we are willing to come alongside and contend with people in prayer and in supplication until the will of God is experienced in their life, until those places of brokenness are made whole. This is about that, not about us. This is about that. This is not about us. God's heart is for his people. That's what this whole week is about. That's what this whole week is about. And I believe, I believe when I look at our church, I think, God, Lord, the rich, rich mercy and history and depth of our people. Oh, Lord, you've positioned us. You have positioned us to be a place where people can come and be welcomed and prayed for and loved and experience the goodness. And they, they don't want to, they won't just be abandoned. I'm going to tell you, Living life with people is messy and inconvenient. I realize that every time my kitchen's a mess, it is inconvenient and loud. But oh, man, when people find their place, when people realize that they're called, that they're chosen, that they weren't abandoned, that they're called child of God, 
Oh, man, we have the capacity for so much. But it begins with us. Will we be willing to go into the throne room for these people? Not so that they get it right. Not so, so we think that what should happen happens. No, so that they would experience a move of God in their life. That they would experience a move of God in their life. We must press in. We must press in to enter. Matthew, if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 26. This is familiar. And here is Jesus, and he is going with some disciples. And it says, and Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray. Oh, sit here oh, while I pray over there. And then he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and, his, and, they began, and he began to be sorrowful deeply distressed. This is Jesus. He's experiencing deep pain and distress. He's becoming sorrowful. He's beginning to, what's happening, what's about to happen is beginning to weigh in. Then he said to them, my soul, this is, just think about this, Jesus, the, the transparency of, of this moment. He's saying, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Number one, now there's an invitation to these disciples. He's now first said, say it, stay with me. And now he's saying, stay and watch. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying this. Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came and he found the disciples and found them sleeping and said, what, could you not watch with me for one hour again? Interesting time. We don't see time often, but here he's bringing out one hour. Could you have not given me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter, unless you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And a second time he went away and prayed saying, oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, unless I drink, your will be done. Does any of this sound familiar? Your will, let your will be done. All right, we're going to come back to that. And he came and found them again, asleep again, for their eyes were very heavy. So he left them, and by this point now, he just is leaving them be. But what an opportunity it could have been for them. So he left them and went again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he said to his disciples, then he came to his disciples and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the, excuse me, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinner. Rise up. Let us let us be going and see my betrayer at hand. There was an opportunity and invitation that he was being offered to, to him, to them. And they missed it. And it wasn't for their, for, it was for their purpose. He said, lest you enter into a place of temptation. I'm telling you guys, it's gonna be uncomfortable, but we need to keep at it. When I read this, when I read scripture, when I try to get into the word, I don't know if anyone's like this, I can get a little distracted. In fact, I told Jay the other day, I said, I need you to keep my phone away from me because I'll, I will legitimately go to pull up a verse. And then I'm like, oh, I want, and then I just like, now I'm gone. And so when I read this, there's a little bit of, of myself I see in Jesus because here's Jesus, he's coming back. He, to me, it feels like he's a little distracted, maybe not. But I feel like he's, I, I saw myself when I go to do something and then I come back to, okay, no, nope, nope, I'm on task here. And then I go back over here and then I, that's how I see Jesus a little bit. Like he's a little distracted and clearly he was distracted. He was deeply sorrowful. The disciples were inv invited to press in. But Jesus kept going back. Jesus kept going back and praying. Jesus kept going back and pressing in. I'm telling you, it might feel uncomfortable and you might not be at an hour. You might not be at five minutes. You might not be at 10 minutes of prayer. Keep going back. Keep going back and press in and press in and press in until all of a sudden your five minutes turns into 10 minutes and your 10 minutes turns into 20 minutes and somehow you find yourself praying for an hour. And thought, How would this ever be possible? It's because we got to keep pressing in. See, we, we live and I, I, I try to, we live in a place of ease, comfort and quickness, right? We ease, comfort and quickness. 
I don't, I don't have stuff for dinner. We can just go get food. And within seven minutes, we'll have dinner. And within 10 minutes, we can be eating it. And then it's probably gone in like two minutes because we inhale, I inhale my food so fast, right? So like I just inhale it all. So within less than 30 minutes, I've bought my food, waited in line and eaten it all. Like that's not, that's, I'm going to tell you, I, I've been trying to cook. It takes a lot more than 30 minutes to make something good. We got to keep at it. We got to keep at it until all of a sudden we press in and we press in. And like Jesus, we can come and we can, okay, I'm going to come back. Okay, I'm going to come back. We got to continue to press in. The other thing is, it didn't say that Jesus just prayed. Jesus says, not as I will, but as your will, which if you're familiar with the Lord's prayer, which is how he instructed people how to pray. Now he's demonstrating it in his own words. He's not praying his circumstance. And I think this is so key for us. He's not praying his circumstances. He's praying the word of God. He's saying, okay, this is deeply sorrowful, but if my cup, if I need to take this, then your will, not my will, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught us a blueprint how to pray. The blueprint is the word of God. That's what he was demonstrating. He, he, in scripture, well, by this, now we read it in scripture. He says, this is how you pray. Now, when he's praying, he's praying what will ultimately be the word of God. And that's how we ought to pray. So as we pray, we need to pray the word of God more than the situation. We need to pray the word of God more than, than, than uh, summarization, repetitions of what's going on. As I said, he already knows. Now, it does say in scripture that we need to let our requests be known, that he does say that. So there is an element, let us our requests be known. But the word of God is what we must pray out loud because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Every time I'm declaring God's word, not only am I declaring what he's doing, I'm building my faith. Every time I exert God's words out of my mouth or I shout them or I say them or I whisper them, I cry them, I barely breathe them, whatever it might be, I'm praying the word of God and my faith is being built up. My faith is being built up. My spirit is being built up. And I begin to remember, oh, I get to boldly come into the throne room of grace. Oh, this is mine. I have access to this. My father said so. I'm going to tell you, I have kids. So if one kid says to another kid, hey, get off your phone, come upstairs, come downstairs to eat, whatever it is, likelihood, 50-50 chance that they're going to hear it, right? The sibling might tell the other sibling why, why, blah, 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 and now they're in an argument. However, Majority of the time when a sibling tells another sibling, hey, mom or dad says it's time to eat. Hey, mom says get off your phone. Hey, mom does this. Mom, it's a different authority that they walk in, right? Oh, now now I know I'm just not dismissing you because the siblings, they do that. They can dismiss each other super easily. Now they got to dismiss mom or dad. Whole different authority, whole different level. Do you get what I'm saying? So when we're coming in to pray, we need to understand that we need to be praying the word of God. Psalms, back to Psalms 56, verses one through four. He says this, um, be merciful to me, O God, for man would have swallowed me up. Fighting all days, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day. For there are many who fights against me, O high God, most high. So here David is saying, look, they're coming after me, Lord. But what does he go on to say? Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you, in God. And then he goes on to say, I will praise his words. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what can flesh do to me. See, David is saying here, not only am I going to call out to you, but it's your words I'm going to put my trust in. I'm going to declare your words out of my mouth, not my situation. I'm telling you, this is where the game changer begins to come. David spoke that the truth was unfound in the world, word. And while we need our requests to be made known to him, we also have to let our requests know what we know about God and his word. I'm going to say that again. While we must know, while we know, oh, well, this is why I get off my notes. We are to let our requests be known, but we also have to let our requests know what we know about, what we know about God and who he is and that his word is true and his word will not return void, but it'll do, go out and do the very thing it has said itself to do the word of God must come out of our mouth. Hebrews chapter four, 
um, just a little bit before about it talking about entering the throne room of grace. Uh, verse 11 says, let us therefore be diligent to enter rest, lest anyone should fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God, for the word of God, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow. And it is the discerner of thoughts and an intent of hearts. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Here's what it's saying. This word of God, this scripture can cut through any circumstance we are facing. It is the discerner of thoughts. That means while I might make my request known, as I begin to declare out who God is, as I begin to declare out what he said, it begins to pierce through situations. It begins to divide. It begins to divide my own thoughts of where I'm just being like cuckoo crazy in my mind and letting it run wild and having no self-control over my thoughts. Has that ever happened to anyone? Okay, only me. I uh, Thank you. Um, sometimes my thoughts can just go and I just play, press play. Oh, they hate me. Oh, see, did you see the way that they, and that must be, and it, that, no, 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 no. What I begin to, God, you fearfully and wonderfully made me. Lord, you say you correct those who love me. So if you're not correcting me, if I don't feel like there's correction, then I keep walking towards how you created me to be. And when you bring correction, guess what I'll do? I will heed you, the voice of God. Do you see the difference between the through two? I begin to get my eyes off the situation and I begin to declare what is holy and what is right. We get our eyes off the situation and be declare what is holy and true and right. The words must come out of our mouth. They must come out of our mouth. The last, last piece on this is number, is I don't know what number this is. I started numbering them and then I stopped. <laughs> Lastly, we don't, have to, we don't have to leave the throne room. The throne room gets to come with us. Think about this. We don't have to leave the throne room. Yes, we do. We read in scripture. There are times where we go into our, our, our hidden places. We close the door and we pray and we stay there. We stay there. We stay there. But we don't ever have to leave the throne room. Jesus says this in Matthew 6. He says, your kingdom come. Where is it going? Where is it coming to? It's coming with you and I. When we're going into situations when we're saying, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's coming with us. That's the intent. The intent is when I walk into a room, I am not just coming in as me. I'm coming in with the rightful authority as a child of God. I'm coming in as an heir of Christ. I'm coming in knowing that when something seems off, I can stand there quietly and begin to pray in the spirit and the Lord begins to show me. Or I begin to say, what's unsettling to me? Gosh, what's, what's happening? I can begin to mutter under my breath, God, your will be done. Lord, is there something that's happening here? Help me see what I need to see. Help me discern what's going on. That's how our kingdom comes. We're not supposed to just walk into a situation and let it be. We encourage ourselves. We build ourselves up. Your kingdom come. The throne room of God can come, us, come with us wherever we want it to go. But then the throne room comes with you wherever you got to go. There's some accountability there too. And I say that, right? Where it says in scripture, what you do in the light will be, what's done in the dark will be brought to the light. That can be twofold. Like, I, I know sometimes what, what might happen in the dark might be good or bad, but the Lord will bring it to light. The other thing is when I come in, I come in as a child of God into every situation I'm walking into with the throne of his presence inside of me. And so it matters how I treat people. It matters what I do. It matters the words that are coming out of my mouth. My mom used to always, <laughs> go figure, used to always tell me, Susie, love kindness, love kindness on your tongue, honey. Death and life are in the power of the tongue because um, go figure, I had a, a little bit of a problem. Like I just would say what it was and then my mom would just be like, Law of kindness. I thought it was, I, I was chuckling as I was thinking about that this morning. But we see in Psalms, I think it's 56, where he's like, Lord, guard my mouth. Help me to guard my mouth. Like just because we think it doesn't mean we need to say it. Just because it's true and it's bad and it's of darkness doesn't mean we need to call it out. What we need is a discernment of the Holy Spirit working in and through us so we know exactly what needs to be addressed. Because we might be addressing one thing over here and that's not even it. It's just the distraction of everything. And the Lord wants to say, I want your king, my kingdom to come with you wherever you go. I want you to be aware that there's something that needs to happen. And maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's just a hug. Maybe it's just praying. You're sowing seeds. Like not 
everything has to be something, but it might be something, but his kingdom is intended to come with us wherever we go and walked out every day of our life. And that we would be people who would boldly, 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 just like my kids, friends, boldly come in and say, I, I belong here. And we begin to declare God's presence and promise over what's happening. The presence, the power, and the anointing is something that we get to walk in daily and not ever have to leave it. I just, we don't do it. I mean, like, this is like me too. Like, this isn't like, hey, no, like, I, I don't do it. I walk into so many circumstances emotional about, like, whatever, maybe not even eaten, you know, like, it could just be as simple as that, and I've completely forgotten, oh, you're a child of God. You, you can do something here. You can, you can pray. You can pray out loud. You can go lay your hands on that person. Like all of those things, like there's a progression of what we can do as his children and comfort and growing and all that stuff. Two more things and then we're done. First John chapter two. First John chapter two. Verses 24 through 27. Therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. We've already secured that. So that's the promise he's, he's given us. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Okay, so again, nothing is new under the sun. Everything we're walking through, nothing is new. Like, players might have changed the scheme of the enemy is always a scheme of the enemy. He is, there is nothing new he can do. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't, it's not, whatever, whatever you're facing, a good chance, not everything. Sometimes it's just us being hangry, you know, like not everything's the devil, but sometimes there is, but we need the discernment to see, do I need something to eat or do I need a move of God? Like it really can be that simple. The not trying, it just, it is. So here's the deal. So our security has been given to us. So verse 27, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Everyone said it abides in me. It abides in me. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as he has taught you, you will abide in him. Just think, yes, amen. Just think about that. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is there to teach us. We, we don't need to be qualified to do any one of these things. He's already qualified us when he died and rose again and we, we submitted to his lordship and saviorship of our life. And here we're reading in the scripture that it's saying, when you abide in me, the anointing that abides in you will teach you. Let that be a place of freedom. You do not need to be the most eloquent with your words. You do not need to have all of these things that need to be. What you want to move in is the anointing and the move of God, which will teach you in all circumstances. That means in the places that you're even the most gifted and talented in, and guess what? The Holy Spirit is there to teach you in that situation. We don't have to, the Lord, we keep, I think we've just become so smart and so much information that we think we got to have the answer and we've actually taken God out of the equation because he wants to be glorified. He wants to, he, he says, I would be glorified. So the anointing that abides in us will teach us and we will abide in him. So today we're going to do something very simple. I'm going to have the worship team come up and we're going to practice one simple thing. When we begin to pray out loud, it sparks and ignites something in us. So when we pray out in a group and when we're praying and we're pressing into the throne room of God in a corporate place, when we begin to cry out to God and I begin to pray, what I have found more often than not, it triggers something in me. Now that word's been used a lot. It triggers something in me. It ignites something in me that then resonates. And I say, yes, Lord, that's, that's my prayer right there. So what I'm going to do is we're going to, I'm going to pray two scriptures, two scriptures that I've been praying as we're entering into this Easter season.
And I believe that these two things about us pressing in together into the throne and what he can do is as I pray, I'm going to demonstrate very vulnerably. I don't, I, I am, like I said, I'm just going to show you what I've been taught by both, um, in scripture, by my mom. This is how I pray. Um, because I am not eloquent enough to know how to pray. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to read a scripture and I'm going to pray that scripture. And as I'm praying that scripture, as I'm saying that scripture, if there's a part in you that resonates in it, whether it's for your own family, whether it's for someone you know, now what I want you to do is begin to pray out and come in agreement with me. So you got to vocalize this. Now, I am Mexican and Puerto Rican. There is nothing quiet about any of my heritage. None of it. We eat, we, we eat, we're loud, we're vocal. Like that's just who I am. It's part of, it's the noise. So it's, it's I, I'm comfortable with, with talking. I understand we live in a cultural place where being proper and manners and being polite, I call it the Midwest nice, right? Oh no, I'm in your way. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. Right, we do this whole thing. So for us, there's some of us who have been brought up in Midwest nice. And so when someone says, hey, I want you to vocalize or say something, it feels a little bit calm different than what you've been told, right? Or a little bit different than the culture you've been experienced. But what I'm going to have us do is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as I'm praying with us, and those of you who are joining us online, hi, um, I want you to do this too. I want you to practice and realize this is a safe place. No one's judging you. No one's listening to you. Although Sam once told me she could hear me singing from the back. I know she listens to me. So when I'm off key, I laugh and I look because I know she can hear my voice. Makes me smile. So she's the only one that's like, Mom, I heard you singing today. That's it. But no one's judging you. I say all that to say no one's judging you. No one's watching you. No one's going to say, oh. But what I'm going to do is I, as I'm praying this scripture, I'm going to pray two scriptures. We're going to maybe about three to five minutes. I want you to come in agreement with the scripture I am praying. And then they're really easy. I'm going to have the first one up. The first scripture that we're going to put up is John chapter six, verse 44, John chapter six. No man, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at that last day. So we're going to be praying with the intention of knowing that there are people that need to be drawn to the Lord. That as we're giving out these invites, that there's people who have walked away from the church or have left because of COVID or whatever it is, that need to be drawn in. Not by fantastic teaching, not by anything other than the Lord. The next scripture we're going to pray, if you'll put the next one, is Jeremiah 31, 3. Um, the Lord had appeared to old, of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Okay, so these are two scriptures. I'm going to go first. First one will be in John. I'm going to pray that. But so you know. So as we're going, we're just going to begin to declare God's word out. And if there's someone or something that you know by name, you need to ask the Lord to draw in, call them out. Call them out. Let's go and let's press in together. This is going to be uncomfortable and that's okay. We see Jesus kept going back. Jesus kept going back. So we're going to press in because this is about pressing into his throne room together. See, there was an invitation that, that the disciples had that they chose to not participate in. That's between them and the Lord. What you choose to do is between you and the Lord. I'm asked to do this. Your response is to be obedient to him. And we're going to practice pressing and praying the word of God. Because this is how we get into his throne room. We get his word and we begin to declare it out. We begin to declare it out. We begin to declare it out. And now we find ourselves in there and we're praying and we're praying. We're, and we're praying our heart's prayer. We're praying for that person you saw that it didn't set. We're praying. Does this make sense? So we're going to begin to pray the word of God. All right. So they're going to lead us in some worship. After I'm done praying, then we'll do a song and then um, I'll close this out. All right. So you guys can all close your eyes. Oh, Heavenly Father, we 
thank you. We thank you that we can come boldly into your throne room. And you can start praying now too. You don't have to wait for my instruction. You guys can lift up your voices out. So Father God, I thank you that you say that we can boldly come into your throne room of grace. We can come and find mercy and we can find grace in time of need, God. So God, we thank you as you're teaching us, as you're teaching us how to call out to you, God, that you are never leave us or forsake us, that your word can be prompt, your word can be trusted. Lord, we thank you that your word will not return void and it will do the thing that it is sent out to do. So Father God, right now we call out. Lord, your word says that no one can come to you unless the Father who sent you draws them in and you will rise them up at the last day. And so God, we come before you and we call out people by name who need to be drawn to you, Lord. Lord, that there is no other way, that you are the only way. So God, we call out for those people who have been known that they have walked away from you, God, or who have found themselves in places of comfort. God, we say, would you draw them into you? Would you draw them by your Father? Lord, we thank you that you know them by name. You know right where they are. So right now, as we're praying together, as we're lifting up our voice, as we're entering into your throne room, as we come before you, God, we say, would you draw them in, in Jesus' name? Would you draw them in? Lord, would Easter be a catalyst that draws them in, God? Lord, that you would do what only you could do, God. Lord, we thank you that you love your children, that you love them, that you know them by name, that you've not forgotten them. God, and so Lord, it says in Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord has appeared of old to me. Lord, I pray that you would appear to people. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would appear to people, God. Lord, won't you do it, Lord? I pray that we would rise up with faith, that you would appear to people, God, whether it's in dream, whether it's through someone else, whatever, whatever it is, Lord, would you appear to them? Would they know that you're calling out to them, God? And Lord, we pray that as you appear, Lord, your word says, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you in. Lord, I pray people would be drawn in by your loving kindness, by your tender mercies, God. Would you draw them in, Lord? Lord, where there is resistance, Lord, that you would begin untangling those places where people have been tangled up with the wrong things, that you, where people have been beginning be, uh, believing lies, that they're rejected, that they've lost it, that they've been a burden. God, oh no, your word says that our prayers are an incense to you, that our prayers are being poured out in the tabernacle, in the place where you are found. So God, we pray and we call out for these people. Lord, we thank you that yours, our salvation is secured in you. And so Lord, we come contending and interceding for people who don't know you, God, for the people that you've placed in our lives that don't know you, who've walked away. Lord, we call and pray that the truth would be revealed. Lord, that the truth would set them free with so much that's being spit at them, with so much knowledge and all the things that we know, God. We lay those things at your feet. Lord, we say, have your way in this place. Have your way, Lord. Where marriages have been broken, Lord, that you would restore. Where children have walked away, that you would draw them in with your loving kindness. With people who have blatantly turned away, Lord, would you call out to them? Would you send by your Holy Spirit ministering angels out to them, Lord, that they would be drawn in by your loving kindness, God, because it is really only your grace and mercy that brings us in. Lord, we thank you that for what was set before you, Lord, you did it. Lord Jesus, you said, not my will, but your will. And God, we declare that in this place, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, that we would be people who carry your presence with us wherever we go, Lord, that we would not walk in condemnation or guilt of what we should have done, but Lord, that every day your mercies are new every morning, God. Every morning there's an opportunity for us to reset ourselves. So God, I pray and I call out for those people that we would be awakened, that we would be awakened to what is around us, awakened to the people who need you, God. Lord, we just thank you for who you are. 